Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to a brand new episode of Boss Babes. We are back at it again. I could not be more thrilled. I have my brother with me, Ryan Malady. You guys may know him from Netflix. He's on multiple TV shows. He's on My Dead X. He stars in that show on Netflix. I believe it's a movie. I cannot wait to hear all about it. Ryan and I are like brother and sister. We have known each other for seven, eight years now. We live together in Los Angeles with one of his good friends. They're both from Colorado. So Ryan Malady is a writer, actor, producer, former reality TV personality, you name it. What is up? <laughs> what an intro. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I love it. Hello. What is up indeed, Brittany Baldessari. Brittany Baldy, sorry. <laughs> oh. Brittany Baldessari, Brittany Baldy, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I love it. You know what's funny is, you know, I know that you're an old friend of mine, and every, you know everyone at home who might be listening knows you're an old friend of mine because you you introduced me as Ryan Mallaby, and that's the way that I, I we used to pronounce my name back in the day. It has since changed, and this is, I guess, what the cool kids are saying now. What are they? What do they Ryan, call you now? What they're saying is Ryan Malati. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? It. I know. I know, and all my old friends, they still call me Malady. You know, I'm sure if I ran into my old football coach, he'd be like, Malady, give me a lap. But <laughs> not not that long ago, uh, actually, it was like maybe five years ago, maybe, um, I heard my dad, like, oh, he was talking on the phone, and he said, so, you know, was, my dad's name's Ez. It's Ez uh, Malady. And I'm like, Dad, what do you, did you say M M Malati? What is it, Malati? He's like, oh yeah, yeah, that's how it's that's how I'm saying it now. I'm like, what what since when? And my brother was started saying, I got two little brothers. One of them started saying Malati, hey, I'm Brandon Malati. Connor was the last to go. He was Connor Malady for a while and he finally switched over. But it, apparently that's the way he was saying it before he got to America from Egypt. And then uh, when he got here, he tried to, you know, Malady is a little more Americanized. Um and then he just kind of shifted back. He says it's kind of easier to say, and I kind of agree with him, Ryan Malati. But you've been grandfathered in. I got to take a poll one of these days to see like what what the preference is. Good to see you, Britt. Good to see you too. I had no idea that you had multiple ways of saying your last name, so I'm gonna have to stick to the original because I don't want to butcher it the new way. Uh, say it however you'd like. Uh, no, actually, I want to hear it. Give it a try. What is this? What? Ryan so, Malati. Go give it a try. Ryan Malati. Ah, it's pretty good. You it's know, it's like funny Pilates. Is, it's like Pilates, but Malati. <laughs> I should start a Pilates shop. Call it Malati's Pilates. I'll open up, open up a coffee shop and call it Malates. I want the listeners to get to know you behind the scenes because for those of you guys that are listening, a lot of you guys have seen Ryan obviously on TV, but I'm sure most of you that are listening don't know him behind the scenes. So I want you guys to learn a little bit about our friendship, the fact that he grew up in Colorado, fact that he has brothers he has an Egyptian background he's really interested in that whole culture and Aladdin and lucid dreaming and dream journaling so there's so much that we are going to touch upon but first our friendship Ryan and I actually met on the set of MTV's Are You The One we will talk about that later on but Ryan our friendship I feel like has blossomed since that TV show we lived in LA together we have remained friends for seven, eight years. I feel like you, out of that whole cast, you are the one friend that I stayed very consistently close with, whether it was us calling each other on our birthdays or sending each other text messages or just keeping up mm. with everything. How the heck are you? And what do you feel about our friendship, especially meeting on a TV show like that with 19 other crazy people? Those are two very different questions, Brittany. <laughs> they are. I'm going to break it up, I think, into part one and part two, if you don't mind. Part one, our friendship, well, obviously we met on, I guess it's not obvious to everyone, but we, you and I met, you know, on Are You The One, that reality show, the reality game, game show, reality mm -hmm. dating game show. It's just this powerhouse of a, of a niche of television. And uh, we hit it off because we're both super rad, I guess. We made the move together, and uh, from I was in Colorado, you were in Boston, and we moved out to LA together because, like, it's where it's at, right? And 
you know, Brittany, I gotta say, you were one of the best roommates I've ever had. I, I've been living on my own since I was 17. Not really on my own, actually. I've always had roommates. If I, now that I'm thinking about it, I've had, I had roommates when I went to college. Um, I had roommates uh, after I graduated. Uh, and I had roommate, and then I moved out to LA with you. I've been living with people ever since because it's just so much more affordable. And it's kind of nice to have you know, someone to live with. Yeah, you were great. We lived together for a year in LA. And we did forge that kind of brother sister relationship. And you know what, Brittany, you, you opened the doors to a lot of uh, avenues for me. I mean, you started working at After Buzz TV and then I followed suit. You were always just so ambitious and you're still doing that today. And so, uh, gosh, it's just great to, to see you, hear your voice and, and be a part of your show. I mean, for those who don't know, Brittany and I, we hosted podcasts together at After Buzz. We, we worked together, not only on Are You The One, but on After Buzz on different podcasts. There's one memory that I had not too long ago, it kept on popping up. I was at the beach with you and it was like the sun was going down, but it was still really warm out. And uh, I just sprinted. I remember I just felt this urge to sprint across the beach, like down the shore. Um, and my God, it was just probably one of the most blissful feelings I've ever had. And I remember you were there and then, you know, we just had such a great time together and you're out there on the East Coast killing it. And I'm on the West Coast surviving. So I'm proud of us in the evolution of our journey. Part one, part two. What was the other question? Something about Are You The One? 19 Strangers? Yeah, I was people. just kind of asking, like, basically, I wonder why out of all those other strangers, you and I became very close. Even though we had mm -hmm. such different personalities, you and I, as a friend and as like, just like a bond in general, I always wondered like, I wonder why Ryan and I are still really good friends and why him and I chose to move together to LA. And I think my reason for that is you and I were one of the only set of people out there that liked to, I think, consciously think outside of the box and kind of have like a little bit of a spiritual input on things. So I think that's why you and I like intuitively click together and I can't, I'm not speaking for you. I'm speaking for myself, of course, but yeah. I always loved that about you where you were always fun and lighthearted mm -hmm. and free spirited. And I loved the fact that you were into journaling and the spirituality because I'm very much so into that now. And I think just intuitively, that's why we've always clicked together as friends. That's from my perspective. Well, yeah, you know, especially from your perspective I and mean, people are always right from where they're sitting. Right? Uh, for me, it was, uh, you know, you were just easy to get along with Brittany you and you're you always have this like ray of sunshine bursting out of somewhere no matter what always happy always laughing always high energy ambitious you let stuff just like bounce and rub off your shoulders you're always like ambitious you make me feel ambitious when you're just like oh you know you get up and you go and you do things and that's a good energy to have around you know, especially in times where you just kind of want to not do stuff. And then you have someone around you that's like, God, get up. What are you doing? It's beautiful. Is it? You were in the land of dreams and make, uh, you were always just a driving force like that. I think that's a, that's important to have in a, in a friend, a, in a relationship. It's just, it makes you want to be more than who you are. That was such a beautiful answer. You guys are now listening to one of my best friends of all time, Ryan Molody. I'll say it the correct way. Or one of those live, you know, talk shows. It was go out and do fun stuff that never makes air. It's just for the it's just for the live audience, just for them. Oh, this is all just for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, let's talk all about Colorado, your early years, growing up there with your brothers. Just paint the picture for the listeners what it was like growing up in Colorado with your mom and dad and just having all of that awesomeness around right. you. Like I absolutely love your brothers. I love your mom. I've met your dad. What was it like growing up? in Colorado. <laughs> I love it. I love how you're like, I love your mom. I met your dad. <laughs> well, cause I don't really know your dad that no, well, I, but I know your mom very well because she stayed with us a little bit, but I met your dad for like two seconds. No, I know. It's just funny. Yeah. All right. A little bit about me. I mean, I was, I was actually born in uh, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, but I feel when people say like, Oh, where are you originally from? That's what I say. But I always feel so dirty saying it cause I'm not, from there, you know, I, I went to Colorado when I was like two or three years, two and a half, three years old. Uh, 
and I grew up there. And I got to tell you, Colorado is just a, a beautiful place to grow up. I grew up right between um, Boulder and Denver, and uh, that's how I grew up. It was a beautiful childhood. I mean, we, we didn't, like, have a lot of money by any means. My mom worked at home. She did daycare, so I helped with that sometimes. And um, so I love kids. Grew up with kids. I have two little brothers. I was always, like, kind of like the role model, or at least I was supposed to be. And uh, Colorado life was nice. I, um, yeah, liked it. My parents aren't together anymore, but, you know, when they were, it was, it was a nice family. Went to college. Uh, so did my brothers. We all went to the same school, University of Northern Colorado. And uh, we, we, we all through three went through the same fraternity. That was kind of cool. Who was the and most I, competitive out of all of the brothers? Probably me. Probably me. Uh, we all did sports growing up, but, um, you know, I was always trying to uh, trying to be the best because I kind of like was up until up until I felt like I was like the best at like sports and academics all the way up until like I got to high school. And then I started getting beaten out by like other oh, people who are better at me than this or better at me than that. But up until then, like growing up, I was always felt like I was the best. So like I had to I had to maintain it, prove it you know, achieve it. Um, and my brothers were younger, so they didn't stand a chance. So they were like just fodder, you know, they were just like practice, but we all played sports. I played every single sport there ever was growing up. I mean, accessible to me, I played like soccer and baseball and football and basketball. And by the time I got to high school, I was doing football, you know, I was an outside linebacker, running back. And I was actually on the swim team. I was a diver. I was a champion diver for 5A. And then Colorado, they have their own kind of sports. They have a rock climbing, you know, whitewater rafting, uh, mountain biking, uh, ice climbing, jet skiing, water skiing, skiing. <laughs> I was never a snowboarder or like a – I did skateboard because all the kids did in middle school. You know, you got to be cool. You got to skateboard. But I was much more into like blading, skiing, water skiing, anything you're facing forward. I like that. Get me on my side. I'm a little awkward. It sounds like you were very athletic. I do want to definitely touch more upon swimming shortly. Of course, this is a lifestyle sports podcast, but it's definitely not your typical sports show. That's why we have my good friend Ryan on here today. We're going to be talking all about TV, movies, where he grew up when he was younger, family life, lucid dreaming. I cannot wait to speak about lucid dreaming shortly as well. But before we get into that, funny family stories. I'm sure having brothers living in Colorado, there has to be some type of funny family story, whether you guys traveled somewhere or somebody threw cake in somebody's face at like a birthday party. <laughs> uh, sure. Yeah, let's see. What do we got? Five, six years ago, we, um, we made a video of us slapping each other in the face in slow motion as, <laughs> our, version, as our version of a Christmas card for the family. Uh, <laughs> The Milati brothers just slapping each other in slow motion in the face to bit like to the to the background of like this epic music. Da, 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 da. Is all of you guys have awesome personalities? All of you guys are doing very well for yourselves. And I had no idea that all of you guys went to the same college, so that's super amazing. For those of you guys that are listening, you may or may not know that Ryan actually comes from Egyptian descent, which I always thought was one of the coolest things about him. And I want you to talk about that. Like, what part of your heritage do you find yourself that you relate to the most? Like, is there anything that, like, you guys like to eat because you have that cool Egyptian ancestry? Mm -hmm. Does, like, the lucid dreaming come from the Egyptian ancestry? I want people that are listening to learn more about what it means to have an Egyptian background. Totally. Again, two wildly different topics, but I'm going to try to seam them together somehow. Uh, first, being Egyptian, I always thought it was cool. I always thought it was a cool nationality. You know what's funny is when I was a kid, we were first learning about African-American happenings in, in this country and civil rights movement, Martin Luther King and everything. Um, it was in like second grade, right? And as a as little, little kid, you don't really, I, I didn't really see like race as a thing. You're kind of taught that it's a thing. I, I, as far as I know, I mean, for me, of my own subjective experience, I, I remember just thinking like every kid, every person was different, different hair color, different eye color, body shape, nose shape, 
Everyone, everyone was different. Everyone was different. Uh, but this was the first time you're actually learning that the the differences in the, these people uh, is plays a a larger role in the human drama, right? So we were learning about African Americans and, and their plight in the country. And I remember thinking, oh man, my people, you know, because my dad is from Egypt, which is in Africa. And so I figured we were African American. It's just what I thought. And for, you know, while I was going through that, was, there was this other African American boy. And we were like, we we're like together in this, you know, because we we're learning about all these hardships that I guess black Americans went through. Because that's the thing is I'm not in part of that African American part of history, right? It's like a black, like Afro-American or black American thing. Uh, because African, you know, is, uh, that's not what they were talking about. So eventually they're like, you know, Ryan, you're Egyptian. You're not African American. You're it's in Africa, but it's different. Okay, Ryan, it's different. Eventually I learned that. But it, yeah, it is, I always thought it was a pretty neat ethnic group to be a part of. What's interesting is my family is actually Coptic. Coptic Orthodox, Coptic Egyptian, which means that they were actually remnant of the people who were the ancient Egyptians, I guess, right? Because you have the ancient Egyptians who studied like the book of the, the worship, the book of the dead and all that. And then that evolved to, ended up being taken over by paganism, right? And then that basically kind of whittled down to Coptic Orthodox, which is like the first Christianity, I guess. And so because of that, I guess I have a direct lineage back to ancient people, which I always thought was pretty cool. My mom is uh, English, Irish, you know, so I got like the half and half going on. But I always thought being uh, Egyptian was pretty neat, just unique, you know, like how many like ancient civilizations go back that far? Like not many. And so it's kind of neat. Uh, and they're still around today. Egypt is still around after all these thousands of years. So I thought that was cool. I feel like everybody just learned something from that, including myself, about the different backgrounds and the history. And I loved learning a little bit about your mom and the fact that you're kind of half and half and how you as a kid, you had other people around you that you were able to feel relatable to. The second part was about lucid dreaming. For those of mm. you guys that are listening, freaking Ryan is so cool. He knows how to lucid dream. And I remember he would like wake up and tell me these, these like freaking bizarre dreams. And now I don't think it's as weird because since I've started meditating four or five years ago, Ryan, I will tell you this much. I have learned how to lucid dream and my dreams can come to reality now. Um, so that's why I wanted to talk to you about it. When did yeah. you first realize that you were able to lucid dream and how did it affect your childhood and how does it affect you in the present in a positive way? You know, my first major experience with dreaming was not the best, most positive experience. I had night terrors when I was a little kid. Just awful. Just awful. I, I couldn't even, to the extremes of all sensible perception, I was like pushed. By that I mean, when you're dreaming, your mind's eye Right, your mind's eye is, is creating an experience for you, right? Like we're all experiencing things all the time when we're awake, we're conscious, we have eyes, ears, emotions, sense and smell and taste and touch. And, and this crafts our reality around us. We're able to take in information because of our senses. An interesting experiment, just to further illustrate what I'm talking about, is if you're watching right now or listening at home or whatever, I want you to think about a pizza. We've all had pizza before. I'm sure you, you know, think about like a special kind of pizza. Maybe, maybe pepperoni pizza. Maybe, it, maybe it's just right out of, uh, you know, for pizza Friday at school or something. And, you know, you can see how it smells, how it tastes, put it in your mouth, how the, the cheese is melted on top. There's a little bit of sauce, but the crust is kind of hard and flaky on bottom. You feel that? Or even with something else, like an elephant. Think of an, as soon as I say the word elephant, you think of one, right? Do you think of the word or do you think of the animal? Is it cartoon or is it real? Is it on grass? Is there a blue sky? You're now thinking of all these things. I mean, every time that you take in sensory information, you're crafting an image in your mind. More than just an image, but smells and tastes and yada yada. What's interesting is when I had you pretend to eat the pizza, part of your brain 
that lights up when you actually eat pizza also lights up. It's the same kind of thing. Now, obviously eating pizza as a real like life experience is going to be kind of more visceral and more real because it's actually happening and stuff. But when you imagine those same areas of recognition of like what pizza smells and tastes and looks and feels like light up when you think about it, when you imagine it. Very fascinating. Your brain does almost doesn't know quite the difference. I mean, you do, but like it's there. And so with dreaming, the same kind of thing is happening where your mind's eye is just creating things based on your experiences. And I mean, it's just the essence of pure creation. The idea that we create while we're unconscious, why, you know, that we experience while we're unaware. Dreams are so fascinating to me in that way. Um, so much so that I, I love writing about different stories that involve dreams. You know, I, I used to keep a dream journal. I guess I still do. I don't really write in it as much as I you know, used to. But if you want to talk about lucid dreams, that's, that's another topic where it's lucidity. The word means, you know, um, awareness, basically. Um, when you're lucid or aware in a dream, it means you're aware of everything that's going on. You're aware that you're dreaming. And you kind of have a, one of those more visceral experiences where eating a piece of pizza would probably more or less be somewhat of the same experience as, as if you were awake. Lucid dreaming is, is some people can do it, some people can't, you know, it takes time and practice. And, you know, the way that I did it, the way that I figured out kind of how to do it was you do have to journal about your dreams every morning. Every morning you wake up, you write down something you remember, even if you don't remember much, if you, all you remember is, uh, you know, the color blue, you write that down. Um, every single morning you'll wake up with your mind more trained to be more aware of what just happened. So every morning you wake up and your dreams will become a little bit more vivid, a little bit more specific. There's also, I forgot what it's called, I'm sure there's someone made up a term for it, but if you can do something throughout the day, that is very specific to kind of root you in the here and now. Uh, then when that moment comes up in your dreams, um, you'll, you'll be able to kind of get a grip on it and realize you're dreaming. For me, it was looking up at the sky. Now, I love sky watching. I love just, it's how I kind of I meditate. Lay down, watch the sky, day or night, doesn't matter. I just think it's a beautiful thing to gaze into the beyond. It's something that we share with all our ancestors, you know? Tens of thousands of years ago, they were still just staring up at the sky, thinking about it all. Here we are today doing the same thing. For me, it was that. So when I would be in a dream and I would see lights in the sky doing weird stuff or crazy stuff or like like giant asteroids or like zippy UFOs or, you know, something weird, I would go, whoa, and then realize I was dreaming. And like, that's how it would start for me. And a lot of the different lucid dreams that I have kind of have the same theme. I'm always kind of like, you know, maybe like in a water park where everything's, because I feel like when you move and you're lucid in a dream, when you move, you're moving kind of through like almost kind of a fluid nature. It almost feels like you're kind of swimming, but it's air, it's through air. Uh, so my mind kind of makes up for that by putting me like in a water park. Cause it's like, oh, okay, here's how you're moving. Also always like some kind of hotel, like a big hotel, where there's a lot of doors and a lot of places to go a lot, because a lot of times your mind doesn't know what it wants to, to create for you and or what you're going to actively create for it. So if you're wandering through this hotel and you open a door, anyone can be in that door. Anything could be in that door. There could be open a door to a whole new world in there. With a hotel, there's a lot of possibilities. Every room could be different. So the key is focus on something. Some people, it's a watch like a watch face, like watching it tick by for a few seconds every day. Like they just keep checking their watch. For me, it was looking at the sky. Uh, for you, it could be uh, trimming your plants or whatever it is that like root, roots you in reality, grips you in this world. And then in the unconscious one, you'll be able to maybe play around. I don't know. It's write it down every morning and see. Writing down dreams is, is, a, is you know, it's a fun practice whether you're trying to become lucid or not, you know, you could write things down, learn, th learn something about yourself. It gets you going. It gets your juices flowing in the morning. It's a fun practice. 
I really should practice what I preach. I found that answer very fascinating. And the reason why is I actually love ancient Egyptian history myself, which is another reason why I think I always kind of found you to be super interesting. I actually have, I believe the Eye of Ra airing sitting next to me, but I wanna ask you this question and it's very serious. It's not like me being sarcastic or anything. Do you believe you are able to hone into your dreams and tap into that unconscious mind a little bit better than I would say most of the population because you are Egyptian? And the reason why I ask this is, for those of you guys that are listening and don't know much about ancient Egyptian history, I mean, I'm no expert myself, of course, but they highly believed in there was an afterlife, they had different gods and goddesses, and they truly believed in mummifying the body and preserving, I believe they preserve the heart and I think potentially the brain, but I could be incorrect, but they truly believed that life continued after death. So I want to ask you, Ryan, because you just mentioned that you kind of have a background with some of these ancient Egyptians. Obviously your dad is has ancestry from Egypt. Do you think that you can naturally tap into the unconscious world and maybe the underworld because you are from that ancestry? It's very fascinating. I truly find this freaking fascinating, probably because the last four to five years I've gotten very good at meditating. So I'm being dead, dead serious by asking this question. Well, you know, that's a very interesting thought. I think it's pretty fascinating using your imagination and, you know, creating stories and whatnot. Uh, but I'm also like a skeptic. You know, I love the idea of like UFOs and UAPs, but I'm also a skeptic. You know, I love the idea of like ghosts and, and angels and all that, but I'm a skeptic. You see, so when you say, do you think that because of your ancient bloodline heritage that you have some kind of interesting ability to walk the planes? Sure, that sounds cool. Uh, but, you know, I'm a skeptic. I, I doubt it. It can be an archaic and dangerous thing to suggest that anyone's ethnic background, bloodline, or lineage could influence the world in any way that, you know, someone who isn't a part of that group can. I would say, yes, I'm a genie. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I freaking no. love you. But yes, I do love that answer. And, and that's a fair answer. And I know it comes off as very like skeptical and there's really no right or wrong way to answer that question. So I guess you answered it fair enough. You are a yeah, genie. Yeah. And I'm going off of the genie topic, I know you're into magic, so we will speak about magic as well. Magic. Look, I love saying to people that uh, there's there's two things I know for sure is that you are loved and magic is real. And what do I mean by that? I mean, magic is it's the belief in the unbelievable. You know, that's the possible out of the impossible. I mean... Ultimately, we're all here because something happened to, to make us, you know, get here. I mean, even scientists can't explain. I mean, they, we have the, this theory about this Big Bang, but we don't know where it came from or why. Religious people say that God made the heavens and the earth. We don't really know why. We just kind of have to come up with explanations for things as people. And that's magic. And magic is all of it. All the things we don't know. You know, all the the mystery and marvel of the universe that we just fail to have answers for. I mean, no, 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 we have answers for, but we fail to truly, truly explain. We have explanations, but the truth, we don't have that. Instead, we, what we have is magic. I love, I love magic. I love magic tricks, illusions. I mean, that's kind of, I think the, um, the face of what magic is, is magic tricks. It's just making someone believe something that, couldn't have happened. It happened. Uh, so I love doing, I, I studied magic when I was younger. I wanted to be a magician professionally. That changed after I went to a show in Vegas and I was like, I don't want to do that for a living. It, it, magic's fun. Sleight of hand is fun. It's fun doing tricks for kids. A coin or something. You can make anything. Just here's a, oh, here's a guitar pick. Ready? Like, 
the, oh, there it is. And then I grab it, Miss Hand, and then that, oh, it's gone. You know, I don't know if you got that. You are loved and magic is real. For those of you guys, again, that are listening now to the Boss Babes Lifestyle Sports Podcast, I'm your host, Brittany Baldi, with a brand new episode. Of course, it's a lifestyle sports podcast, but today we have my good friend Ryan on. He's an actor, writer, producer, and of course, you guys know him from MTV's Are You The One? The reason why we are talking about all these topics that may seem a little bit random, they actually are not that random. The fact that he comes from an Egyptian ancestry is one of my favorite things about him. And that's why I really wanted to tap into that because it's not something you hear about every day and you definitely don't meet somebody that has a background like that. So I find it very interesting, but we will switch on over. Thank you so much for sharing so much about your childhood, your brothers, your mom, your dad, your ancestry, and of course, growing up in Colorado, sports. You already hit upon the topic of playing many sports as a kid, you guys all being very competitive, Swimming. I remember being in Hawaii with Ryan and he literally was like ripped to the gills, like loved to go swimming, was always the one in the pool, probably first and probably out of the pool last when we weren't doing a competition. That was like his way of like working out and staying cool. So let's talk about diving. You, I didn't have no clue that you were a champion diver. What the heck? Was this in high school? Was this in college? Give me this backstory. Yeah, it's ripped to the gills. I love that one. Swimming. Love it. I love the water. Always have. I was a lifeguard for like three years back in school. I was working for the city of Westminster for a little bit, to be teaching swim lessons and whatnot. I uh, got into swimming and diving because my one of my like my best childhood friend growing up. We did everything together. One day he joined the swim team. Uh, football was bad on his knees, you know, and 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 he said, "Hey man, Ryan, um, you know, we need a diver. Like if we just had a diver, we would have won our last." like two meets, you know, because diving is a whole other category. It's just like, we don't even have a diver. The guy going like last, we would have won. So I joined, I gave it a try. And I was like, uh, kind of good at it. It's kind of like gymnastics. It, you got to be really crazy to do diving, man. You, you got to have, you got to be a certain kind of person to like willingly like hurl yourself as fast as you can towards the water, a back dive or an inward dive. You're like an inward dive. You're standing on the end of the, the diving board facing towards the board and then you jump and you do a front flip. So you're going towards the board. It's like wild, uh, but it was so much fun. Cause it's like a thrill. Every dive was like a thrill. I just love, you know, the adrenaline of it. It was really exciting. Um, but yeah, I went to 5A state. That was only my second year. I ended up graduating early. So I didn't really like fulfill my, my diving like you know career. And the college I went to didn't have a men's team. So I didn't really continue it, but it was a lot of fun. I would do like, front two and a halves, you know, front uh, one and a half full twists, uh, you know, inward one and a half pike. It was a lot of fun. I, it wasn't that impressive, but it was just impressive enough to where I like, I, I thought I was kind of good. And I would also swim too. I would do like belays and like the 50 free and the breast stroke, or I'm sorry, the, the, the butterfly stroke. Gosh, swimming is just such a great workout too. I mean, for the whole body, but mainly because you're breathing so much, you're breathing so hard and, and you know, you just get it like a great core. Oh, it just stretches you out. You just feel great. I love swimming. And uh, I recently actually got my boating license because I'm out here. And my brother just bought a boat in Colorado. I'm out here in L.A. I used to kayak in Colorado. I'm a kayak out here. Thinking about getting myself a boat, going out into the ocean. I just love the water. Something so free about it. also love flying. I always wanted to be a pilot. Something about the water, the air, just not being – well, I don't know. There's something freeing about being in the mountains too, when you're just deep in there. So I guess air, sea, and land, as long as you're free to move about the way you want, uh, the elements, man, that's where I want to be. Ryan, all of your answers are always so poetic. They're always so freaking poetic. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you too, because you hit all the nails on the head with the swimming, feeling free, just being one with the elements. Again, I knew you were a very good swimmer because like I said, just being in Hawaii with you, I noticed how much you loved the water. And again, being ripped to the gills. Yeah. At what point did you freaking know that you could do these flips? Like, how did you even recognize like, okay, I'm gonna try jumping off this diving board today. Maybe I can do a twist. Maybe I can do a double twist. Maybe I can try to do a backflip. Like, did you do gymnastics as a child? Like how the hell did you go from 
playing football to being like, you know what, let me just freaking jump off this diving board today <laughs> and become really good at it. Sure. You know, I, I think I might have done gymnastics when I was really little, but I don't remember. I think it's just an athlete's an athlete, you know, and uh, you're going to grow up, you're going to be athletic. And to be honest, I was always kind of, I just felt like I was invincible. As a kid, you don't really know limits. You push your limits far, far enough, you find out there aren't really any uh, until there are. Right. So, uh, but growing up, you know, I never really thought I was, uh, I could fail. Um, everything was just a challenge, not a failure. And when, when my friend told me, Hey, we need a diver, you know, I could do flips on a trampoline and stuff like, why not? Um, I'm pretty flexible and pretty strong. I could do this. Uh, so I went to the rec center and I just tried, I just practiced on my own, knowing nothing, knowing nothing about form or technique. I just kind of ran off the, <laughs> the end of the board and just threw myself I tried to, I was like doing the dive and I did a, a front flip and most people can do that. But I was like, I wonder if I could go even further and do a one and a half. And eventually I was doing a one and a half on my own. So I knew that overcoming the fear of what it's going to feel like when I fail, by which I mean, do the flip wrong or flip too much or not enough and just like smack the water. How much is that going to hurt? You never know until you experience it. And so when I started just trying it and hurting myself, I was like, oh, wow, wow, that, that hurt, but not as bad as the anticipation of it did, as thinking what, what will it feel like when I fail was so, held me back so much more than what the actual pain of, of like messing up was. So I think that's kind of like the way it is in life. Like, you're going to always regret the things you don't do more than the ones you do. And not throwing yourself off the end of a diving board was more terrifying than, than doing it and getting hurt. And I remember my first day of practice, I went in to, to diving practice. And the coach had me, he taught me like the, 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 the approach and like how to jump properly and stuff. And then showed me, he's like, all right, he's like, so show me what you can do. Show me a, a one and a half. And I, and I did because I had practiced it the day before at the rec center. I could do it. And he's like, okay, do a double. Two front flips. Two. My first time ever, first time at diving practice. I'm like, uh, okay, how? He's like, just do what you did, but hold it longer. <laughs> and uh, I ended up letting go a little late because I held longer than I wanted than I should have. And I, I went two and a quarter and smacked my face, two front flips and, a, and another quarter turn smacked against this glassy surface of a pool. And I broke the membranes in my nose. So I, I get up out of the pool and I'm just like bleeding, just a river of red all over my body. My body's just covered in blood. Uh, it probably looks like it's more covered than it is because it's wet, you know, the water and everything. But, like, it looked pretty gruesome. Like, I was, like, just coming out of battle. And he's like, all right, we'll go hit the showers. And I'm, I'm walking off. And the entire swim team was, was like, walk, like watch, watched me, like, walk away. And they're like, oh, my God, like, diving so, like, diving so hardcore. Did you see that guy? He just got messed up. You know, so from then on, like, diving was, like, the hardcore sport. But you never know until you hurl yourself off the edge. Yeah. It definitely sounds like you were a natural gifted athlete. And we see those skills, obviously, in Are You The One with some of the challenges that we had to do. We will be speaking about that a little bit later. But speaking of pro athletes, mm -hmm. which sports did you and your brothers enjoy watching as kids? And were there any professional athletes, whether they were male or female or a combo of both, that you guys enjoyed watching growing up, whether it be Tiger Woods or Michael Jordan or... Anybody, who did you guys idolize when you were younger? Well, you know, I'd say the athlete that we idolized when we were younger was our dad. He's been in baseball ever since I can remember. He's still playing baseball. He's in, a, he's in an adult league. He manages it and he, he plays for it and they do really well. Go Mudcats. He's, you know, he just turned 60. Uh, so he's, he's still, he's still an athlete. But when we were younger, he was a really, really good bowler, actually. Yeah, he bowled like I think he's I think it was like 
eight or nine three hundreds in his career, and then like four times as many two ninety nines, something like that, something wild. So I can tell you what we watched most often was bowling on Sundays. When my dad was off of work, you know, and we're all just sitting around the house doing laundry. It was just bowling on the TV all the time. We didn't like it. We didn't like watching it, but it was there. <laughs> My dad would watch bowling and baseball, and we liked watching him play, but like, as kids, it just always reminded me of doing laundry. Bowling and laundry. Hey, welcome to Brittany's Boss Babes, where we're talking bowling and laundry uh, here on a beautiful uh, Wednesday evening. <laughs> I would say probably like, you know, I remember the early 90s, it was John Elway, you know, Terrell Davis, Ed McCaffrey. I mean, these guys were the Super Bowl winning Denver Broncos, 96, 97, both years back to back, or was it 97, 98? It was a tight end for, uh, for Denver Broncos, 90, you know, the dream team. That, that, was, that was the team we, we liked watching as kids. Denver Broncos, that, that, that was a good time to be a Broncos fan. And I was a little kid. Man, that, that game between the Denver Broncos and the Green Bay Packers, that was a, a special time. It was the first time I ever had shrimp cocktail was that Super Bowl right there. But yeah, no, uh, Ed McCaffrey's now, I think he was the head coach at UNC, Northern Colorado, the college I went to. Uh, but then COVID hit, so we didn't really get to see what he could do. So, and being out in LA, you know, they don't really play a lot of Denver games, so I kind of became like a Clippers fan because I'd go to those, those games, you know. And uh, and the Rams are now in LA, so I'll go go Rams, go Broncos, go Clippers, go Nuggets, go, uh, go Stars, go Avalanche, and... Um, you know, go Rockies, go go Dodgers. I'm like, I'm like both. I'm split. I feel like at this point you have to be split because you've been in LA for so long. So you have earned your wings, Ryan, to be a fan of both the Colorado teams and the California teams. So all the props to you. I love that we've been speaking all about sports and where you grew up. Love that you hit upon the athletes that you guys used to watch um, as kids and. It's so freaking sweet that your dad was one of your biggest idols and he still plays baseball now. Sounds like he's still very athletic. I wanted to have you talk a little bit about your fascination with Disney. I always loved the fact that you were into Aladdin and just like singing and being very upbeat and lighthearted and fun. Like you were always that person on set that just enjoyed being you. So let's talk about where the heck did your fascination with Disney begin? And obviously you are into acting, so I'm sure that kind of took into effect as well. You know, I think I might have mentioned earlier, my mom did daycare, like at home. So we always had kids over and most of them were usually younger than me. So, I mean, they were my age for a while, but then as I got older, they stayed younger. And so my mom had a very respectable VHS collection of the Disney classics as they came out, right? For all the kids at home, VHS, you know, cassette tapes. We still have them. Every once in a while, when I go home to visit, I'll pop in an old VHS. It's uh, it's good nostalgic fun. Anyway, we had all the Disney movies, all of them, and that's what we would watch. I mean, how could you not like the Disney classics? They're they're amazing. It's no accident that Aladdin and Beauty and the Beast and The Lion King and all these movies ended up on Broadway. They're on Broadway and they do great because. They're great stories, great songs. The animation's, you know, top quality. It stands the test of time. A lot, not all of them, but like a lot of them were hits, man, and they still are. That's my, that's my favorite movie is The Lion King, 1994. I remember I saw that movie in theaters when I was a kid. I remember because I also remember running out of the theater on all fours because I was a lion. I was Simba. It was just so inspired. I was like, I'm going to be a lion when I grow up. I just love playing pretend. I love what Disney movies uh, or just any, I mean, Disney did it well, really great for a long time. They're, they st they still are, but like any, any great studio does, that does child geared animation that, or, or, or stories that can appeal to a child, a child can understand it. It can be powerful for them, but it's also, understandable, relatable and powerful for other ages as well. I mean, I still watch the Lion King and, Full grown man, and I still I will weep, you know, at Simba over his father, dead father. Spoiler alert! <laughs> I just love living 
a world where anything's possible. And with your imagination, that's the case. And with Disney films and with child animation, I mean, it just makes you feel like anything is possible. I remember, yeah, I dressed up as Aladdin in Are You The One? Well, namely, because I had a great costume that one of my ex-girlfriends like made for me. We made it together kind of, but she kind of like did most of it, but it's just a fantastic costume. It's got a lot of miles on it, man. I wore it for Are You The One? And I pulled out, I think I had some kind of lamp, didn't I? And then <laughs> I wore it on Let's Make a Deal with Wayne Brady. I wore it, I, I went on that show. I had a producer friend who invited me to come on, so I did it. And I all I had at the time was a gravy boat. And I remember he had to stop the, the filming of the show because he was laughing too hard because I pulled out a gravy boat <laughs> from my pants. But since then, I've upgraded. Check it out. The real deal. Here, ready? Oh my gosh, I love that. So uh, what the heck? That's like formula. an actual genie yeah, lamp? Yeah, she got it from Disney World. An actual awesome. real life. Look at this actual lamp. Look at that. Making wishes. And I love making wishes, Brittany. I got to tell you, I make wishes all the time. And I don't know if anyone's listening or if it means anything, but I think that aligning your intentions with yourself is very important. Because whether or not there's like some external force or universe thing, presence or anything, I mean, that's great to think and believe and maybe it's true and maybe it's true for you. But either way, when you make a wish, I mean, you're thinking, you're focusing on something. You may have an intention about something and making a wish just only reaffirms your intentions. And I think it's just so important, especially like your intentions are the thing that are guiding and, and dictating your your actions, behavior and and how you reciprocate your emotions and thoughts. I mean, intentions are everything. And I love making wishes. And I think there's so many different ways to make wishes. I mean, you could rub a magic lamp and get three. You know, a lot of wishes, it's interesting. I was thinking about it the other day. A lot of wishes are made through the breath somehow or some way, right? You can uh, you know, hold your breath uh, under a tunnel and make a wish. Uh, you can take a deep breath and blow out all the dandelion fluff and make a wish. Um, you blow out a candle on your birthday cake to make a wish. An eyelash, if you find an eyelash, you blow it off your finger and you make a wish. Uh, something about breathing, the breath, making wishes. I mean, comment below, how do you make a wish? Shooting star, fortune <laughs> cookie? Wishes are, you know, one superstition that I subscribe to.